Yeah, good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so uh, today we are going to, uh, our topic today is going to be on surrender. And uh, before we uh, start the topic, I'll just make a short prayer before we start. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord, with humble hearts, recognizing that surrender is a vital aspect of our faith journey. Lord, we acknowledge that surrendering to your will and your plans is not always easy, but we know that it is necessary, Lord, for us to experience the fullness of your love and grace. Lord, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for waking us up once more today, this morning, to listen to your word and to sing praises to you, Lord. So as we delve into this topic, Lord, of surrender, we ask for your guidance and wisdom. Open our hearts and minds to understand the significance of surrendering our lives to you completely. Help us to let go of our own desires, our ambitions and control, and instead surrender ourselves to your perfect will. Lord, we surrender our fears, our doubts, and our worries to you. We surrender our plans and our dreams, knowing that your plans for us are far greater than we could ever imagine. May your Holy Spirit empower us to trust in your sovereignty and to have faith in your goodness, even when we don't understand. Teach us, Lord, to surrender our burdens to you. We lay before you our struggles, our pain, and our weakness. We surrender our need for control and invite you to take the lead in every areas of our lives. Fill us with your peace and assurance as we surrender our lives to your, into your loving hands. Help us, Father, to surrender our selfish desires and to embrace a life of self, selflessness and service. May we be willing vessels, Lord, ready to be used by you for your glory. Give us the strength to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow you wholeheartedly. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of surrender. We trust that as we surrender to you, you will transform us, mold us, and shape us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ, who you so long to see in each and every one of us. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So today we are going to talk about uh, surrender, brothers and sisters. And uh, Sister Jairani, you're there, Sister Jairani? Yes, sister, praise the Lord. Yeah, okay, praise the Lord. So how many of us, uh, how many of you worry? So I'm pretty sure everybody does. Even I used to worry. I worry a bit sometimes. But uh, during this time that I've been going through all these things in my life, you know, so the Lord has given me many messages during all these uh, last 15 days. So and one of the messages that he gave me is to surrender totally to him. And that was something that I, I have, have not been doing all along. As in, uh, I always thought that, yeah, I do fear God and I have that reverential fear of God, but I always used to take things in my control, you know, and I'm not just leave it up to God alone. So I used to retaliate or do something like that. But today the Lord has told me, you just stay still and know that I am God. And he's told me to surrender. So that that's why today I wanted to talk to you all about surrender and how many of you worry. So I'm sure pretty of everybody does. So why? Because Jesus once told a parable so, sister, can you read Luke chapter 12, verses 16 to 21? Yes, sister. Luke 12, sister. 16 to 21, thank you. <clears throat> then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night, your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? 
So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. This is the gospel of the Lord. I mean, so then Jesus goes on to tell his listeners. He goes on again to tell his listeners. So sister, can you read 22 to 28 also? Yes, sister, sure. He said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? If then you are not able to do so small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown Amen. into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? Amen. Amen. Thank you, sister. So the, in this passage, uh, Luke 12, um, chapter verses 16 to 28, so in this, I also got a message. So when the first day when I was going through my problem and I was left with just the clothes on my back and, and this mess, this passage gave me such a message like, you know, that God really provides for everything. You don't really need anything. Every day he gives you sustenance. He gives you whatever you require. But all he's asking you is to surrender to him and know that he is God because he is God and he is going to do everything that is good for your, uh, you know, for you. So you have to trust in him and you have to let his power, his grace and his, you know, his, uh, his strength come to you. And that's what he wants you to do, surrender totally to him. So the meaning of this parable is that material possessions and wealth are not the ultimate purpose in life. So the rich man in the parable focused solely on his own comfort. So that's what most of us do today. You know, we are focusing solely on our own comfort and security, neglecting the relationship with God. We don't want to have this relationship with God because God is saying, yes, uh, you know, you are, you think that you are doing everything. You are working. This is all yours. But he's providing everything. Everything belongs to him. We are just his servants. So we have to have that relation. He wants us to come to him every time that we have a problem. He wants us to talk to him like we talk to our friends and tell him what's our problem. So this relation, we want to see our own comfort and security, neglecting this relationship with God and the needs of others. So Jesus is encouraging us to prioritize spiritual treasures and to be generous and faithful stewards of what God has given us. So everything that we have is what is God has given us. Nothing is our own. So we are just stewards. So we have to be faithful stewards. To what God has given us. So this parable is reminding us that our lives are temporary and uncertain. So and it is wise to invest in eternal things rather than being consumed by worldly pursuits. So we should seek to be rich towards God by cultivating a heart of generosity, compassion, and faithfulness. So that's what this parable is telling us. So other and this brings us to why we worry. So we have why do we worry? Because we have little faith. But first, what is faith? So the Catechism of the Catholic Church talks about faith in one of its very first paragraphs, defining it as man's response to God. If you look at Catechism, uh, CCC uh, 26, it says that to know the triune God, so to believe God the Father. So faith is first of all a personal adherence of man to God at the same time and inseparably. So it's a free ascent to the whole truth that God has revealed. It is right and just to entrust oneself wholly to God and to believe absolutely what he says. So this is what uh, CCC 26 says, to believe in Jesus Christ, the son of God. For a Christian, believing in God cannot be separated from believing the one he sent, his beloved son, in whom the father is well pleased. So God tells us to listen to him. Telling, he's telling us to listen to Jesus. The Lord himself said to his disciples, believe in God. Believe also in me. So we can believe in Jesus Christ because he himself, God is God. He himself is God and the word made flesh. So no one has ever seen God, the only son who is the, in the bosom of the father and he has made him known. So because he has seen the father, because Jesus has seen the father, Jesus Christ is the only one who knows him and can reveal him. So Jesus is the only one who can reveal God. 
So to believe in the Holy Spirit, so one cannot believe in Jesus Christ without sharing in his spirit. So it is the Holy Spirit who reveals to men who Jesus is. So we will get our revelations about Jesus only through the Holy Spirit. But no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit who searches everything, even the depths of God. So no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So only God knows God completely. So we believe in the Holy Spirit because he is God. So the church never ceases to proclaim her faith in only one God, but in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So faith is a grace. Basically, in this in this uh, CCC uh, of the uh, verse uh, number 26, faith is grace. So when St. Peter confessed that Jesus is, Christ, is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus declared to him that this revelation that St. Peter got did not come from flesh and blood, but from my Father who is in heaven. So this revelation came to St. Peter from my father who is in heaven. So faith is a gift of God, a supernatural virtue infused by him. So because before this faith can be exercised, we must have the grace of God to move and assist him. So we must have the grace of, and we must have the grace of God to move and assist him. So he must have the interior helps of the Holy Spirit who moves the heart and converts it to God. So the Holy Spirit is the one who uh, moves the heart and converts it to God, who opens the eyes of the mind and makes it easy for all to accept and believe the truth. So the Holy Spirit is the one who's playing a vital, important role today in our lives. So he's the one who will move the heart and convert it to God. So faith is a human act. Believing is possible only by grace. So we can only believe by grace and the interior helps of the Holy Spirit. But it, it is the no, no less true that believing is authentically human act. So trusting in God and you know cleaving to the truths that he has revealed contrary neither to human freedom nor to human reason. So in faith, the human intellect and will cooperate. And the divine with divine grace. So, what do uh, what does the human intellect? Uh, it will cooperate, and will will cooperate with the divine grace. So, believing is an act of the intellect assenting to the divine truth by command of the will moved by grace by God through grace. So, we believe in the Holy Trinity, one God, three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We cannot leave out any person of the Holy Trinity. So, faith is a gift, a grace of God infused in our hearts to the help of the Holy Spirit. So even though we have the interior help of the Holy Spirit, faith is, is an authentic human act. In faith, the human intellect and will cooperate with divine grace. So now also the creeds, if you look at the Nicene Creed, it is more elaborate like the Apostle, Apostles' Creed with a big spotlight on Jesus' divinity. So through the centuries, uh, many professions of symbols of faith have, you know, uh, articulated in response to the needs of the different eras. So when, whenever, uh, whoever says, I believe, says, I pledge myself to what we believe. So communion in faith needs a common language of faith. So normative for all and, and uniting in the same confession of, so the creed is a synthesis of faith. Great importance, you know, gathered from all scriptures, symbols of faith, which help the profession of faith. So the creed is divided into, the Apostles' Creed is uh, divided, or the Nicene Creed is divided into three parts. The first part speaks of the first divine person and the wonderful work of creation. The next speaks of the divine person and the mystery of his redemption of men. And the final part speaks of the third divine person, the origin and source of our sanctification. So who is the origin and the source of our sanctification, the Holy Spirit? So the creed is are in a, a perfect summary of, you know, the Christian faith, of course. So it does not cover every detail, although so the Apostles' Creed was the first creed handed down by the Apostolic Church and the church councils have added, you know, extensions to it. So like every country has an anthem and every, uh, you know, sport team is song, the church has a creed and which we should profess with love and with great pride. So this is on CCC. Simply put that this means that we respond to the things that, you know, we respond to the things that God does. For instance, so God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. So every one of us knows the scripture is John 3, 16. So responding in faith, involves believing this. So believing that Jesus died and rose again and constant, uh, consequently secured our salvation. So we need to believe in this. It also involves repenting for all our sins. So the first step is repenting for all our sins and being determined never to sin again. 
so it involves a total surrender of our wills and lives to god it involves total and complete obedience to jesus his word as a way of life and finally it involves a heartfelt devotion and attachment to god that expresses itself in love trust gratitude and loyalty so we will be talking about surrender as a response to faith in this session so as long as we believe we are in control of our lives like we all think that we are in control of our lives even i thought i was in control of my life i could handle everything till one day i was just you know struck and uh, that where i learned so many things and god taught me so many things so as we believe we are in control of our lives our destinies we cannot really walk in the will of god because we are constantly trying to exercise uh, our own will and that's where we go wrong trying to exercise our own will so god is telling me a time and time again surrender so a few stories will help to understand the folly of trying to do this and hopefully help us to see the wisdom of surrendering our lives into the hands of god so for many years under the powerful protection of joseph the israelites enjoyed great prosperity in egypt but soon after joseph joseph and the pharaoh he served under died things began to turn bad so a new pharaoh ascended to the throne and fearing the israelites would come uh, you know would become greater than the egyptians he brought them all into bondage afflicted and tyrannized the israelites cried for deliverance until one day god decided the time had come to answer their prayers so he also sent moses to pharaoh with the messages to let the israelites go to uh, or to face the consequences so pharaoh wasn't impressed and sent moses packing so forced to play hardball god unleash a cert a string of plagues to the egyptians so the stubborn ruler refused to budge until 10 plagues and much much misery later god struck down all the firstborn in egypt including pharaoh's own son you know so pharaoh and the terror stricken uh, egyptians now couldn't wait to see the backs of the israelites and threw them out you know so this thus began the exodus so this is when the exodus began as the delighted israelites put together their belongings and left the city towards their freedom a few days later however god hardened pharaoh's heart yet again and the ruler amassed his troops and raced into uh, after the israelites intending to inflict severe punishment upon them so they caught up with them at the red sea so sister can you read exodus 14 verses 10 to 12 yes as pharaoh drew near the israelites looked back and there were the egyptians advancing on them in great fear the israelites cried out to the lord they said to moses was it because there were no graves in egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness what have you done to us bringing us out of egypt is this not the very thing we told you in egypt let us alone and let us serve the egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the egyptians than to die in the wilderness amen amen so your thank you sister so this in exodus uh, chapter 14 verses 10 to 12 it uh, recounts the events you know following the israelites escape from egypt as they find themselves trapped between the pursuing egyptian uh, army and the red sea so if we go into the meaning of these verses exodus 14 then we see the israelites becoming fearful and crying out to moses you know expressing their regret for leaving egypt so they were terrified because they perceived their situation as hopeless with the egyptians closing in on them so their fear caused them to doubt god's faithfulness and the purpose of their deliverance from slavery so moses responds to the uh, the people uh, sister you read that 13 and 14 as well Sister Jayarani, can you read the verses thirteen and fourteen as well? Yes, sister, sure. But Moses said to the people, "Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Amen." Amen. So here, when I I heard this verse, the Lord will fight for you, and you only have to keep still. So that's 
what I'm doing today, keeping still and letting the Lord fight my battle and letting him take over. So Moses responded to the people's fear in Exodus 14, 13 and 14, saying, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you. So in verse 12, the Israelites expressed their frustration to Moses, questioning why he brought them out of Egypt if they were going to die in the wilderness. So they were struggling to trust in God's plan. In fact, we all struggle to trust in God's plan and deliverance, even though they have witnessed the mighty accident. Sometimes we see so many things that God does for us, still we doubt him, still we don't trust him. So this passage is highlighting the tension between faith and fear. So the Israelites' fear caused them to doubt God's power. So when fear comes in, it, it causes us to doubt God's power. So that is what we need to get out of our system and plan. So while Moses encouraged them to trust in God's deliverance, ultimately God does indeed intervene and miraculously pass the Red Sea, allowing the Israelites to cross safely without drowning the pursuing uh, while drowning the pursuing Egyptian army. So this account teaches us the importance of trusting in God's faithfulness, even in the face of seemingly impossible circumstances. Sometimes you think your situation is so impossible. How are you going to get back? You know, what is going to happen? Like, and uh, I've seen the deliverance of the Lord, you know, in, in, uh, in these last uh, say 15 days. So the account teaches us the importance of trusting in God's faithfulness, even in the face of seemingly impossible circumstances. So it reminds us that God is always in control and can bring about deliverance in ways we may not accept, expect. Sorry. So this verse gave me so much hope and in the situation that I'm presently in. And I felt God personally speaking to me and he's telling me, surrender, Michelle, surrender. You know, just leave it all up to me. I'm in control. And I, he said, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord and will bring. So this verse contains God's command to all of us, you know, who believe in him for those times when we are con when confronted with dire circumstances and extraordinary difficulties. What must we do when we cannot retreat or go forward? And the way is blocked to the right and to the left. You know, ways are blocked everywhere. We cannot go forward. We cannot go back. So the word of God says, God's word says, do not be afraid. Stand firm. So the best thing we can do at this time is to listen only to the Holy Spirit. For others will come with their suggestions and ungodly advice. But the Lord says, be still and know that I am God. In Psalm 46, 10, he says, be still and know that I am God. He said, don't be afraid. It's one of the great messages recurring all through the scriptures. Isaiah 26, 3, you know, we sum it up perfectly why we should not be afraid. Sister, can you read Isaiah 26, 3? Yes, sister. Isaiah 23, sister. 26, 3, sister. Sorry. <clears throat> Those of steadfast mind, you keep in peace, in peace, because they trust in you. Amen. Amen. So it says, do not be afraid is one of the great messages recurring all through the strip. And Isaiah 26, 3 sums it up perfectly why we should not be afraid. You're, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. So when you trust in the Lord, you will keep in perfect peace. All your situation around you is horrible. You think there's no way out. There's nothing going good that is going to happen. But when you are in the peace of God, in the shalom of God, you know that, you know, Whatever people are doing to you, it does not matter because you know your God is in control. So the enemy, however, will come and will whisper, give up. And even in the worst of time, God would have us to be joyful and courageous. So the enemy is always coming. He's always there putting negative thoughts in you. You can't win this. You can't do this. You can't do that. You're not strong enough and you'll get sick. You'll do this. And then he's telling you all the time, give up. But even in the worst times, God would have us be joyful and courageous, rejoicing in his love and faithfulness. So what you need to do is sit in your room, rejoice, praise God, thank God. You know, that's what will happen. Like St. Paul did in the prison. All he was doing was rejoicing when he was happy. So that's what fear will tempt us to act the way the world does. And, you know, when we are in fear, then we'll start doing whatever other people are doing. We'll start doing illegal things. We'll start doing bribing. We'll start doing all these things, which is not of God. And that is what fear, someone will come and tell you, already do this. This will, this will get you out faster. But no, when you go God's way and you go the right way, you don't go by any of these measures that other people are taking to do, the lies they're telling to put you down. But you are just standing still. So fear will tempt us to act the way the world does and try to convince us that it is too difficult for us to continue living the life of a Christian. In a moment of weakness, we might think that being a Christian is too hard. Yet no matter how much Satan may pressure us to follow his course, 
we cannot because as we are believers we are god's children and jesus paid his with his life for our salvation so impatience and anxiety will come yes anxiety comes all the time impatience comes all the time you see how long is it going to take when it is when is it going to work but when you stand still and know that he is is lord it works faster you know you everybody will your your anxiety will tell you come on stand up get up and do something but the very thing we should be doing during this time is having our eyes fixed on the lord because he will not only do something he will do everything and i've seen that you know just fixing my eyes on god not leaving uh, my prayer life not leaving going to church every day not leaving uh, coming to the group every day has has strengthened me so much you know he will not only do something he will do everything so as moses said to his people you will see the deliverance of the lord will bring you today so god has us right where he wanted us to be so the sons of israel were in the perfect will of god and yet their fate was being tested like my fate is being tested so we might be in a situation where we are surrounded and the enemy is coming up from the rear like uh, right now i feel that i am in the enemy camp or i am in my own home but there are people uh, guarding the door so you know it's a horrible situation but i know my jesus is there with me at every step of the way so i don't fear so the enemy is the enemy is mocking and telling us how foolish it is to trust god and tell us that it will do us no good to have faith however god had a purpose in bringing the children of israel to the red sea and he had a purpose for the red sea we might be facing in our lives today he has a purpose for this red sea that i'm facing in my life today so when we face difficulties in life God wants us to accomplish two things he wants us to make known his glory to others and that that is what we do everything we do for the glory of god you think preaching today is for our glory no it is for the glory of god it is for god's word to go out it is for god's message to go out for us to know who jesus is because many of us we say we believe but we don't know who jesus is he wants to make his glory uh, his make known his glory to others he wants us to teach us to trust him completely so many of us don't trust him we are still doubting we are still saying you know I, i'm still in this situation god when are you going to do it when are you going to do it? no he is doing everything you have to keep your focus on him and you have to keep stay rooted to the vine we are the branches we have to cling to that vine so exodus sisters can you read exodus 14 uh, verse 4 yes Fourteen. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, so that I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Amen. Amen. So this uh, uh, Exodus fourteen fourteen says, "But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh." and all his army and the egyptians will know that i am lord so god will make it known to everyone that he is lord he is coming soon and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that jesus christ is lord he will make it known that he is lord so we need to know that he is lord so we must rely we must rely on god's promises he said do not be afraid stand firm and you will see the deliverance the lord will bring you today so the egyptians you see today you will never see again the lord will fight for you you only need to be still so god promised them that he would take care of them and he was going to fight their battle for them yet they were doubting so all they had to do was stand firm and be still which simply means they had to focus on god what is standing is just focusing on god and on his promises and the same goes for us today so that is what we all need to do even though we may be going to so many uh, problems we just need to cling to jesus so god has a plan he may it may be something different that we could never even imagine but he has a plan he will get us to the other side of our red sea he is definitely going to get us to the other side of our red sea he has not left us we are not on our own so we do not need have to fight this battle we just need to stand still firmly grounded in our faith and know that god is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us this is ephesians 3:20 it's such a beautiful verse so keep make a note of it ephesians 3:20 that god is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us so however the enemy will not give up easily as you know the devil is just roaming around he will not give up easily so pride will come boasting so if someone is blocking your way take care of the situation yourself yes true faith never listens to arrogance 
impatience, fear or despair, but only hears God saying, stand firm. So if you have that true faith, you'll only keep hearing God telling you, stand firm. And then that faith, and then faith stands as an Im as immovable as a rock. So if your faith is as immovable as a rock, you will stand still. So we must maintain the posture of one who stands firm, ready for action, expecting fur further orders and cheerfully and patiently awaiting the master's voice. So we need to stand still and just listen to the voice of God. What is he telling us? So it will not be long before God will say to us as distinctly as he told Moses to tell the children of Israel, move on. If you if you read Exodus 14, verse 15. Sister, can you read Exodus 14, 15? Yes, sister. Then the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. Amen. Amen. So here he's telling the children of Israel, move on. And the same he's telling us, move on. He's in control. So in times of uncertainty, he's telling all of us here today, wait. If you have any doubt, wait. Never forcing yourself into, you know. So in uh, sister, can you read uh, Romans 15, 13? Yes, sister. Three thirteen. Romans 15, 13, sister. Yes. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So here's what St. Paul is telling us. And in times of uncertainty, wait. If you have any doubt, wait. Never forcing yourself into. So may he saying, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So as uh, so Psalm 106 gives a Reader's Digest type of, you know, condensed version of the events that followed. So he rebuked the Red Sea. And uh, sister, can you read Psalm 106 uh, verses 9 to 12? Yes, sister. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry. He led them through the deep as through a desert. So he saved them from the hand of the foe and delivered them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them was left. Amen. So here, uh, it, it, in this verses, uh, this verses are you know part of a psalm that recounts the history of Israel, Israel, Israel's relationship with God. You know, and, and uh, particularly focusing on the, rebel the rebellion and God's faithfulness. So let's break down the meaning. So in verses 9 to then the psalmist recalls that the miraculous event of the crossing of the Red Sea, God through his power rebuked the sea, causing it to dry up and led the Israelites through the depths as if they were walking through a desert. So this act of deliverance demonstrates God's ability to save his people from the enemies and his faithful uh, faithfulness to fulfill his promises. So verse 11 emphasizes the outcome of the Red Sea crossing. The waters cover the, ad, uh, the adversaries of the Israelites, referring to the pursuing Egyptian army, and not one of them survived. So this demonstrates that the complete victory and deliverance that God provided for his people. And finally, in verse 12, the psalmist highlights the response of the Israelites to the miraculous ev event, you know, they believed in God's promises and expressed their gratitude and praise to singing. So it, it signifies a moment of renewed faith and acknowledgement in God's faithfulness. So these verses remind us of God's power, faithfulness and deliverance. They serve as a reminder that God is capable of intervening in our lives, even in the face of a seemingly unsurmountable challenges. So it also encourages us to respond with faith, trust and praise when we witness God's mighty act. So what an amazing miracle in this psalm. So God parted the water that led the Israelites to dry land. Then to ensure that the, the Egyptians never troubled them again, he destroyed all of them. So you see what God did. The Israelites were right to sing his praises, but they made one mistake. They sang his praise on the wrong side of the river. So it's easy to praise God when victory has been won. So all of us, when we get our victory, we are always saying, thank you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus, love you, Jesus. And we are praising God. But what about the times and the situation when we are in a problem? So it's easy to praise him when you finally get a job after giving up all hope. It's easy to praise God when you have recovered from an illness 
that the doctors told you that there was no cure for it. So it's easy to praise him when all the debts that threaten to you know, land you in prison have been cleared. But we are required to praise him before victory. We are not required to praise him only after our victory. We are required to praise him before victory has been achieved because we should have the faith that he will grant us the victory. So if we are praising him before we get the victory, we are having that faith that he's going to grant us that victory. So God says that victory, he's going to get you. He's promised you he's going to get you that victory. So he's going to give you the power and the strength and the grace to go through these trial times. And, and he's going to keep you strong. But in that meantime, he's telling you, keep your focus on me, surrender to me, and I am going to do it all. So God does not expect us to put our faith in him blindly any more than he expected the Israelites to. God had given them plenty of reason to put their trust in him. Though 10 of the most powerful, the most awful plagues imaginable. He kept the Israelites safe from harm. You know, they had 10 very bad plagues, but he kept the Israelites safe from harm. So he got Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world at that time, quite, quite possible of all time, to throw open the city gates and grant them their freedom, freedom. So this is what he did. And he had given them supernatural indications of his presence on their exodus in a pillar of cloud day, uh, you know, by day to lead them along the way and in a pillar. Sister, can you read Exodus 13, uh, 21 to 22? Yes. The Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them along the way and in a pillar of the fire by night to give them light so that they might travel by day and by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night, left its place in front of the people. Amen. Amen. So these, this, these verses describe how God guided the Israelites during their journey through the wilderness after their deliverance from Egypt. So during the day, God led them with a pillar of cloud and at night, he guided them with a pillar of fire. So the pillar of cloud and the fire served as a visible manifestation of God's presence and guidance for the Israelites. So the cloud and fire were not merely natural phenomena. They were supernatural signs of God's presence and direction. So they reassured the Israelites that God was with them and leading them on their journey. So the cloud provided shade during the day, protecting them from the scorching desert sun, while the fire gave them light and warmth during the night. So this passage, you know, highlights God's faithfulness, provision and guidance for his people. It reminds us that God is always with us, leading and directing our paths, even in the darkest and the most challenging times. And that is what I felt during the 10 days that I was with nothing in my hand, just the clothes on my feet. And God gave me everything that I could possibly want, food on my table, shelter, everything that I want. He also kept me staying rooted and uh, grounded with him, you know connected with him so that's the beauty of it through all the tension and all the trials he kept me he gave me that time for my prayer time so in this exodus 13 20 hasn't god given us enough and more signs so god has given all of us so many enough and more signs that he is with us over the years so there are so many times when we have gotten into the into a problem and he has got us out of it so consequently in the moments of trial when all we need to do is be still you know and take Care and let God take care of the situation for us. We run about like you know chickens with their heads uh, locked off, trying to do something. So if we don't believe, if we don't, we believe we will perish. So the thing is, God is telling us be still. So and we should let God take care of the situation. But we run about like chickens with their heads locked off, trying to do something. So we try to do something. No, because we are. Why are we trying to do something? Because we feel that God is not enough. He's not capable of you know uh, getting us out of our situation. That's why we are trying to do something. We are trying to get more evidence. We are trying to get something else. We are trying to you know see what we can put uh, some lie to put in so that you know we will get our way. We get no. So God is telling us, be still. So if we don't, you know, we if we don't, we believe we will perish. So that, that's the thing. So most of us are trying to do this extraordinary because we don't know that God is going to do everything. We are trying to work on our own will, our own strength, and we are trying to get all these things. So God is telling you, stay still. So consider what might have happened to the Israelites if they had tried to fix the problem at the Red Sea themselves. If you go, if you go and put yourself in the place of the Israelites at the time of the Red Sea, what would have happened if they tried to fix the problem by themselves? They would have junked all their belongings. Suppose they were running with all their belongings. They would have thrown all their belongings and jumped into the sea trying to swim to safety. So how far do you think any of them would have got? 
So if they had to solve this problem on their own, God separated the sea for them. But if had they to go with their own and say, no, we don't need God. And they would take all their belongings, jump in. So we do the same. Most of us do the same. We are trying to swim across vast seas instead of just putting our faith in God who will part the seas for us and let us walk through without getting so much of a toe wet. So that's the beauty, the power, the strength of our God. He will let us walk through without getting so much as a toe wet. So God wants to perform miracles in our lives today, but he won't when we doubt. So if you're doubting, if your faith is not strong, if you don't trust God, if you're not surrendered to God, then, you know, he won't when we doubt. So even Jesus refused to perform any miracles in his own hometown because the people lacked faith. Sister, can you read Matthew chapter 13, verse 58? Yes, Matthew 13 verse 58. Thank you. And he did not do many deeds of path there because of their unbelief. Amen. Amen. So see, your unbelief is a big blessing block blocker and Jesus cannot perform any miracles if you are in unbelief. So not that the miracle uh, stop people, uh, not that the miracle stop people doubting. So we read in the ne very next line in Psalm 106, uh, in our Psalm 106, uh, verse 13, sister, can you read? Yes, sister. Psalm 106. Verse 13. 13. But they soon forgot his words. They did not wait for his counsel. Amen. Amen. So here he's saying, you know, as we read the Psalm 106 and the 13, he's saying that they soon forgot his works and they did not wait for his counsel. So that's what happen, uh, happens to us. We get a blessing and then soon forget what God is. And we don't wait for his counsel. We don't wait to hear, listen to the voice of God. We don't wait to ask the Holy Spirit whether it's okay. We don't wait to take any spiritual guidance. No, this, so this verse is part of a larger passage in, in Psalm 106 that, you know, it, it, the history of the Israelites as they repeatedly, they repeated disobedience and forgetfulness of God's faithfulness. That's what all of us do. We repeatedly are disobedient and we forget of God's faithfulness. So in this particular verse, the psalmist laments, he's lamenting how quickly, just God, just now God has done so much for them and how quickly the Israelites forgot about the mighty works and the miracles that God had performed on their behalf. So that is what most of us do. As soon as we get our blessing, then we have forgotten about God. We have gone back into the world. We are going about going for our parties, going for our picnics, going for this. We don't want to go to church. We don't want to pray. We don't want to spend time meditating. It's all about ourselves, me, myself. So the Israelites frequently fail to wait for God's counsel and guidance. Instead of seeking God's wisdom and following his instructions, they often relied on their own understanding and made decisions based on their limited human. to seek his counsel and to patiently wait for his timing. So it warns us against forgetting God's works and relying on our own understanding, which can lead to poor decisions and spiritual drift. So that's why when you know you always are rooted and you know grounded, to the, you're clinging to that wine, you're clinging to Jesus. He will never let you make a wrong decision. Wrong decisions will come, but he will tell you, no, don't do this. Go this way. You know, and I've seen it in these last 15 days, the way God is leading and the messages that I'm getting in from the word, you know, and he's telling me so many things. So in our own lives, we should strive to remember God's faithfulness, seek his wisdom through prayer. How do we get our wisdom to prayer, reading his word and studying his word and patiently wait for his guidance in all aspects of our life. So the word is so beautiful, you know, just take a passage every day and read it. And you will get so much of wisdom, so much of knowledge, so much of understanding. Man. So you're okay. so so God performed all these miracles, you know, and so can all the greatest miracles he could have ever performed in the sight of man, parting the waters of a huge sea to let an end. That's such a big miracle, you know, parting the waters of a huge sea to let an entire nation cross over and to be saved from what looked like certain death. Almost. Immediately, however, they forget they forgot what he had done. Can you imagine how what, uh, how ungrateful they were? Almost immediately, they forgot how how what he had done. How could they, especially when God was still doing supernatural things for them at that time? So when they were hungry, he 
he rained manna down from heaven when they were thirsty he had try a smile rock with his staff teaching for so that clothing in game so this is what we all do brothers and sisters the minute we get our blessing the minute we get our healing we are just forgetting god we are forgetting all that god has done for us we are not giving any glory to god so the they close you know they forgot everything that god and and began doubting him again and here in lies the problem for all of us today as well as for those israelites that at that time and the solution they forgot we also forget so that is why we don't grow in faith because we are just forgetting what god has done and how great god is so we don't grow in faith so if we want to grow in faith all we need to do is remember and stand still or to let go so there was a wise man walking up a mountain one day with his foot uh, and when his foot slipped and he went sliding down the slide he he would not uh, he would have gone to a certain death except for his good fortune there was a tree growing out of the mountain side that broke his fall so so he clung um, he clung uh, you know to that uh, to one of the branches and when he looked down he could see all jagged rocks and he he knew that if he lost his grip on that branch that he he clung to uh, then he would die so desperately he began yelling for help and a few moments later he heard this voice saying from above hello there this is god so then he said oh praise the lord he said in relief help me so the voice uh, the voice said answer i will just let go so the voice said it very gently i will just let go so the man said hmm he was looking down nothing had changed the rocks looked as threatening as before so you heard me the voice said let go so the man looked up and he looked down he looked up again and shouted is there anybody else up there so you see what happens to all of us today god is telling us let go you know let go but we are asking is there anyone else up there who can help me is there because we are not trusting in god we don't know that god is telling us let go is there in control he is going to take charge of everything so why is still looking out for somebody up there so we might laugh at this but it's so true for all of us we believe that all, it all depends on us and even when it comes to situations when we cannot do anything we still clutch to what we have you know we are to what are nothing more than straws instead of so we are clutching to all these worldly things instead of trusting in god imagine this scenario you are a little child and your house catches fire you make your way to the balcony which is a good 20 feet off the ground your father is a tin scrawny fellow you know he stands below telling you to jump would you or would you not jump you most probably would why because you trust your father to save you now your father is just a human being and you have faith in his love so we have another person called we call father who is lord of the universe he is infinitely more loving and infinitely more powerful should we not have faith in him yes brothers and sisters we have to have faith in our lord he is our father he is our abba he is our daddy so this is the real secret of faith knowing who god is and knowing what our relationship with him is so it is being his children which comes from believing in jesus so sister can you read john chapter 1 verse 12 yes sister john John chapter one verse twelve. Thank you. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. Amen. Amen. And sister, can you read also Romans eight fifteen? Yes. <clears throat> for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you have received a spirit of adoption when we cry abba father amen amen so this is the what the secret of faith is knowing god who god is and knowing that our relationship with him is is being his children which comes from believing in jesus so when saint when john writes in john chapter 1 12 but all, to all who received him that is jesus who believed in his name that's the name of jesus he gave power to become children of god so paul clarifies this further when we cry abba father it is the very spirit bearing witness to our spirit that we are children of god 
and if children then as as of god and joint as with christ so all this information comes to us from scripture which is which is why it's so important we know it especially the things that christ says and does so with this comes an increase of faith so in this uh, verses chapter john, john chapter 1 the verse is found you know in the opening chapter of the gospel of john which introduces jesus as the word of god who became flesh and dwelt among humanity so in this verse particular verse john chapter 1 verse 12 john emphasizes the incredible privilege and blessing that comes from those who receive jesus and believing in his name so by receiving jesus it means to accept him to welcome him into one's life and to acknowledge him as lord and savior so believing in his name refers to having faith in who jesus is and what he has done for us through his life that and resurrection so do we have that faith brothers and sisters of what jesus has done for us through his life that and resurrection so when we receive jesus and believe in his name a remarkable transformation takes place we are given the right or authority to become children of god that means that we are adopted into god's family and are granted the privilege of a close intimate relationship with him as children of god we have access to his love his guidance and his provision So this verse, John chapter one verse twelve, highlights the incredible grace and the gift of salvation that God is offering to all of us who believe in Jesus. So He's saying, "Work on your salvation." We have limited time left. Telling each one of us present today and all those who will listen, work out your salvation. The time is running short. You know, think about it. It reminds us that our relationship with God is not based on our merit or works, but on faith in Jesus Christ. through him we can experience the joy and the assurance of being part of god's family so romans chapter 8 was 15 says you know that in this apostle paul is addressing believe us believers in christ and highlighting the transformation that takes place when we have a relationship with god he contrasts it with the spirit of slavery which leads us to fear when we are in when the israelites were in egypt they were in the spirit of slavery which led them to fear and bondage with the spirit of adoption which brings now that we have bring, we are children of uh, we have received the spirit of adoption and as sons we cry abba father so which brings freedom and a new identity as a children of god so we all are children of god we have a new identity now so before coming to faith in christ we were enslaved to sin and lived in fear of judgment and condemnation however through jesus we have been set free from the power of sin and death we have received the holy spirit who enables us to experience a new relationship with god as our loving father so the spirit of adoption signifies that we are no longer distant or estranged from god but we have been brought into his family as his beloved children so we can approach god with intimacy and cry out to him as abba father the term abba is an aramic word that expresses a deep personal and affectionate relationship with a father figure so that's what we can call him our daddy we can call him our abba so we have that relation so why don't we all go forward and call him our daddy you know so many of us have lost our fathers but we have our abba father we have our daddy so this verse reminds us that as believers in christ we have been transformed from the slaves to the sons and daughters of god we no longer need to live in fear brothers and sisters but we can experience the assurance of being loved ex- accepted and cared for by our heavenly father so the so the uh, the more that we know him the more we love him the more we love him the more we want to know him that's what happens now as you get to know jesus the more we know him the more we start loving him and then you start falling into this loving relationship with god that you fall deeply in love with god and all you want to know about is god you want to read his word you want to know what his word says because that's so much to tell you and the more we love him the more we want to know him so the two feed each other and as our love grows so does our trust in him and his promises as this grows our ability to great we shall discover you know so how surrender so before we answer that let's answer jesus asked his listeners can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your um, sister can you read luke chapter 12 or that you already read it so i'll just read it or can you by any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life so if you are not able to do a small thing as that why do you worry 
talking about the rest. So can we add an hour to our lives? Forget an hour. Can we add a minute? Why can't we? Because it is not in our control. It's in God's control. So it's most important thing about our lives, which is our life itself is in God's control. So doesn't it stand for reason that God is in control of the rest of the things in our lives? Yet foolishly, we try to retain control over everything instead of simply handing over the reins to Jesus and letting him take control. So now that we have established the why, let us look at the how. Jesus told his disciples, Sister, can you read Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25? Yes. Sister Jaya, can you read Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25? Yes, Sister. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Amen. Sister, I asked uh, you in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. Sorry, sister. Then Jesus, told his, yes, sister. then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Amen. So here he says, if, you, if any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life, will lose it. But those who lose their life for my sake will find it. So we find four steps here and how to lead a surrendered life to Christ. First is the, de the desire to follow Christ. So if any want to become my followers, Christ said, spelling out what we did to walk in his footsteps. The desire to follow Christ cannot come without knowing him. That is why it is essential that we first discover who he really is. So when John the, the Baptist introduced Jesus to his disciples as the Lamb of God, two of them followed Jesus. So when Jesus turned and got them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translates means teacher. What are you, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. And one of them was Andrew. If you if these verses, you can look at, at John chapter 1, verses 35 to 42. You can read these verses later. John chapter 1, verses 35 to 1. So second is denying ourselves. It means turning away from idolatry of self-centeredness and no longer taking decisions based on self-interest. It also means turning our back on the things of the world that might be pleasurable but have external consequences that aren't pleasant. So in his letter to the Galatians, sister, can you read Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21? Yes. Galatians. Chapter 1, sister. Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 21. Thank you, sister. Yes, sister. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. This is the warning that all of us should take it very seriously. I'm warning you, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of So third is to carry our cross. So what this this is a euphem euphemism for death. So in Jesus' time, that's what carrying one's cross meant. That does not mean that we die physically, although we shouldn't discount this. It means dying to self. What is carrying a cross? It means dying to self, dying to our greed, dying to our lust, dying to our desire for power and prestige, 
and passions. Like any death, it is painful, but what follows is glorious. So when we start dying to ourselves, when we start, you know, emptying ourselves out of all the things of the world and filling ourselves with Jesus. So like the resurrection, I'm sure we don't find either command appealing, but look at this form, another angle, look at this from another, another angle might change. So let us say that you own an ancient black and white television. So like a boxy thing, you know, with dials and knobs. So one day someone offers you a brand new ultra slim, you know, uh, flat screen te television at no cost or exchange. <clears throat> Would you accept the offer or not? So if someone offers you the latest model of a phone that you've bought five years ago in exchange for yours, again, at no cost, you might be stu pretty stupid not to accept the offer, right? So what Jesus is offering us today is kind of, the, is kind of like that. He's asking us to trade our old life for a brand new one. And he's promising to replace everything uh, we give up in it with something more wonderful. He's saying he's going to replace it with something more wonderful. So, you know, the time that uh, that I had actually uh, was with nothing with me. And I was the time that I really was not even thinking of the things in my house. Like I was just not bothered or because I knew God would always keep it safe. But the time I realized that we don't really need all these things. We can just make do without it. And God makes us manage in that time. So that, that is what is like, you know, giving up. It's, he's going to replace it with something wonderful. So fourth is to follow Jesus. So the fourth point is to follow Jesus. This does not consist, uh, consist in walking two steps behind. Rather, it is listening to the things that he has to say. And how, where does he say these things? Where do we find the voice of God? It's coming from his word. So listening to the things that he has to say and obeying them. We are not have to be just hearers of the word. We have to be doers of the word. We have to obey his word instead of listening to and obeying the dictates of the world. So we don't have to listen. Now the world is telling us lots of things. It's showing us lots of things on the news, the wars and everything that is going on. But if we keep our focus on Jesus and we know that Jesus has got it all in control, he's going to make, he has a plan. And he knows what he's doing. He, he, we have to trust in him. We have to just cling to that wine. So we don't have to listen, you know, to the things of the world, the dictates of the world. So this also requires us to surrender control of our lives to him. Because as long as we want to do our own thing, we are not going to be willing to follow anybody. So we have to give the control of our life to Jesus. So like the other things on the road, you know, that we have learned repentance and forgiveness. We learned about repentance and forgiveness. Surrender is not something that is accomplished in one sitting, but is a continuous process of relinqu relinquishing control into the hands of the Lord until he has total control of everything. Slowly, slowly, we give him control of everything. And because grace is an integral part of this process, we can be rest assured that God will start moving powerfully in our lives the moment we start letting go. So our spirits lighten along with our shoulders as we cast our burdens to God. Our bondages are broken as we give them to Jesus. <clears throat> Chains of addictions are shattered as we drop them at his feet. Our drinking, our smoking, all these things can be just drop it at the feet of Jesus. And we, as we stop letting the thief steal, kill and destroy, we start leading lives in abundance that Christ promised we would. You know, so that that is it. So what does it, uh, I've got a little few points on what does it mean to surrender to God in all things. So uh, I can't tell you how many times I've asked the question, what does it mean to surrender to God? So I often think I surrender, yet the grip of fear or worry or control clings to my heart in my life. So, I mean, how do we surrender to God in all things, the good things and the bad, the difficult things and the scary things and the painful and the, and the bad? The, the sad. So surrender in the Bible is defined like is, is to cease resistant to an enemy or an opponent or to submit their or this is an Oxford dictionary. So scripture doesn't use the word surrender in the way that we do. In the Bible, surrender is solely used to talk about literal surrender that is in war. So but over and over we see in scripture that lead us to surrender that God calls us to. So first he's saying in Luke chapter 9 verse 23 he's saying deny yourselves. Then second, he's saying in Matthew chapter 11, 28, come to me. Third, he's saying, subject yourselves in James chapter 4, verse 7. Subject yourselves. And fourth, he's saying, give me your heart. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26. And then he's saying, renounce all that we have. You can make a note of these scriptures and read, read them. Luke chapter 14, verse 33. Then he says in John 3, 30, 1 John 3, 30, we must decrease while God increases. 
that's what we, tell, we say every time. We must decrease. And Jesus must increase in ourselves. And then he says, humble yourself in James chapter 4, verse 10. So surrender is all throughout scripture. So we see Abraham step into, out into faith to surrender his son, just as God surrendered Jesus Christ for us. We see John the Baptist surrender and commit to becoming less as Jesus now becomes more. Although he had a big ministry, he was doing everything John the Baptist. As soon as Jesus came, he surrendered and went back. So it's he, he decreased and Jesus increased. So it's clear in scripture that we are to submit to God just as in the standard definition of surrender. So, so what does it mean to surrender our lives to God? So the very first step of surrendering to God is giving God our heart and salvation. So that is if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, chapter 9. So it may not sound like much, but to truly believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and to confess this with your mouth is a great act of surrender. Many people don't want to believe in Jesus. They don't want to believe that Jesus exists. They don't want to know about Jesus. So we have to come to a place of total surrender and submission in order to do this. But there's a powerful freedom to, in this. He says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Stand firm, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We are not supposed to go back to Egypt. We are now in we are, we are the Israelites gone to the promised land already. So we have to get out of this yoke of bondage of slavery. In surrendering our lives and hearts to Christ, we gain freedom from sin, freedom from fear, and so much more. And with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is so beautiful. He, he, he leads you. He, he changes your life for you. And every day is a different day for you. You know, He's taking you through the motions of this life that you've, you've given your, you've, uh, you've, uh, you've offered your life as a living sacrifice to God. So every day God is testing you, trialing, putting you to trials, making it known, is, is she really faithful? Is she really going to do my work? Is, can I, you know, he's, he's testing you every moment. He's baking you into that, putting you into that fire. Like how Shiraj, uh, Abanegu and Mishash went into the fire and God was with them and they kept their faith. Even though they were told like, you know, you have to worship other gods. They never worshipped other gods. They gave uh, only worship to their one God. And that God stood with them in the fire. Same like Daniel. Daniel went into the lion's den and God or shut them out of the lines. So that is what God does. He's such a beautiful God. And the moment that your faith is 100% strong, he does that. So what does it mean to surrender our will to God? It, we have all things that we want, all things that we believe we need. These things may be even good things. So yet to, to truly surrender to God in our will, we must commit all our ways to him. So God can work in ways that we don't quite understand. He will direct and guide us in ways we don't accept. So how do we surrender our wills? So with Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3 said, commit your deeds to the Lord and you, your plan shall succeed. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. So com commit our ways, give them to the Lord in prayer and surrender before stepping forward. Take time to pray and to discern. Pray about everything, brothers and sisters, and discern. Ask for the spirit of discernment. Ask for God for wisdom in all your steps. You know, ask him to give you that wisdom. Acknowledge him is also translated as to know him in all your ways. To know God in each and each of your steps and ways is a powerful depiction of intimacy. That is that we have an intimate relationship with God. We know him in all our ways. So when we take time to pray and to come to God in all our ways, we begin to know him in them. We give, we, when we start wrestling in prayer, when we start praying daily, putting everything forward in prayer, going to our room, shutting the door, and talking to Jesus, spending that time like we talk to our friends on the phone when we gossip and we talk about this and that. The same way we can talk to Jesus, tell him what we are facing, tell him what we are, what is happening. Tell him that he promised us that he's going to bring victory and he will bring victory. So what does it mean to surrender our things to God? Do we hold tightly to our things, our possessions? Yes, we, uh, you know, even for me, we always kept this is mine, this is my jewelry. But are these things of any importance? No, we are not going to take anything with us anywhere. We are just going to go with just what, you know, in that in the coffin and just by ourselves alone without any of our purpose. We cannot take anything. So don't get too attached to the things of this of this world. So I know I can get stuck in the mindset that I need a certain amount of X, Y, Z to be okay, whether it's clothing, it's toys for my kids, decorations in my house, quality, furniture, products. I can often feel like I need something to try. We often want, you know, more and more. The more we have, the more we feel like we are doing very well. We are rich. We've got everything. So we, we, I have been very convicted to stir my family like you know, towards moving 
more, more natural living. So it's best best to move your family towards natural living, clean products and pure foods. Yet you can have you can cross the line of holding on too tightly to the importance. So God can nourish your family through whatever means He provides us. So don't worry about that. God is always going to provide for you. So I don't need anything at all to do the will of God because He will sustain me and provide all that I need. So in Philippians chapter four one, He says, "Not that I speak because of lack." For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And Saint Paul said he did not lack anything. He was rich. He had everything. He see, learned that in whatever state he is to be content in it. So even if you are in a state where you are left with nothing but the clothes on your body, be content in that state because God will provide for you. He will give it to you. So therefore, whoever of you who doesn't renounce all that he has, he can't be my disciple. So Jesus is saying in Luke chapter fourteen thirty three. So whoever of you doesn't renounce all that he has, he can't be my disciple. So don't make all these worldly possessions important. We have to make Jesus important. So whether we have all that we need or are in need, we we are called to contentment. So if we trust in God, that God will meet all our needs, we can pray to God to grow this trust in us and open our eyes to the way that He is providing, and we can truly surrender our things to God. So. I'm just going to give you a few, a few biblical examples of surrendering to God before I uh, I close. Abraham steps out in faith to surrender his one and only son. So it's a heart wrenching story. It's a powerful story. Abraham is asked to sacrifice, literally sacrifice his one and only son born to him in his old age. So can you imagine any of us doing that? And Abraham obeys the Lord. He walks with his son up to the mountain with everything required to make the burnt offering except the sacrifice. God has asked him to sacrifice his son to the altar, just as Abraham is about to do what any parent could imagine doing. An angel calls to Abraham. He said, "Don't lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for I know that you you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me." Genesis chapter twenty-two, verse twelve. So, can you picture any great surrender that, uh, than this? And an exact representation of the sacrifice God made for us in Jesus Christ's death. So Abraham was fully surrendered to the Lord in being willing to obey God, even to sacrifice his own son. So John was willing to surrender his authority against his followers to that of Jesus Christ. So John had disciples. Saint John the Baptist had disciples. People listened to him, respected him, and followed him. So we all have, you know, when we preach, we we have followers or we have people. But we are we have to willing really be willing to let everything go to Jesus. Jesus is our biggest preacher. He's our biggest. So every all the glory goes to God. It is not us. It is only our our mouth, our vocal cords being used to share God's word. Nothing else. No glory comes to us. The glory goes to God. So we are here only to do God's work, not to get any glory, not to get any fame, not to get any fortune. Nothing. We're doing it all for the glory of God, and that's what every preacher should do. Do it for the glory of God. To to make God's name known to everyone. So when Jesus came, John's followers questioned the. impact it would have on john's ministry and john's answer could be summed up in this verse he must increase but i must decrease john chapter 3 was 30 so the total submission of a true to the true authority of christ john knew he had a purpose like we all know we have a purpose we are commissioned to go out and preach the good news it's not that we are doing it to you know because the we got some great to know we are all every one of us is commissioned so god knew he john knew he had a purpose and that purpose was to point to christ and our purpose is to point to christ not to us our purpose is to point to christ so he surrendered all to jesus knowing that in subjecting himself to jesus he was subjecting himself to god so when we subject ourselves to jesus we are subjecting ourselves to god so how did jesus surrender to god jesus lived a life of total surrender to the lord all that he did was that god directed him to do so i can do of myself i can of myself do nothing as i hear i judge and my judgment is righteous because i don't seek my own will but the will of my father who sent me john chapter 5 verse 30 so jesus is saying this he seeks the will of my father who sent me so he surrendered to god even the things he did not want to face he did not want to go to the cross he asked god to take it away but he surrendered to god even the things he did not he asked god to take away the trial he was in the midst of facing and yet in this he was committed to the lord will above all he did not want to go to that painful thing he was a sinless but he he committed to the lord's will above all so that's what let the lord's will be done in our life so he went forward a little fell on his face and prayed my father if it is possible let this cup pass away from me nevertheless 
not what I desire, but what you desire. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. So it's all what the Father desires is what's going to happen with us. So we we may not want it, but God knows what it what good it is going to do for us. And that's why he gives it to us, because he knows it's going to do, it's going to be for our own good. So Jesus surrendered his life to the Lord, and I can and I can, can I mention he did this for you and for me. He committed his very spirit to God as his body died on that cross. This is the ultimate act of surrender. Jesus crying with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands. I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Luke chapter 23, verse 46. So, at, and it is because of his ultimate surrender, you and I can come to the Lord and find his peace, his joy, his redemption right where we are. So, praise God for that. So, how, how to give it to God and, and let it go? We are called to cast our cares on the Lord, but to truly give it to God and let it take persistence and commitment, casting your worries on him. Because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5 verse 7. And as you learn to grow and trust in that God is sovereign and working in each and every moment and season, you can begin to let go of the things you hold tightly to pray to God to help you in this. There is the freedom and peace in the sort of surrender. Find scriptures that remind you of his sovereignty, his goodness, and remind yourself the ways in which he has been in your life. So what does surrender, surrendering to God look like? What does it particularly look like to surrender to God? So let us... Let us uh, pray for a heart to surrender. Start with prayer, you know. Pray pray for a heart to surrender. Pray to actually surrender. Even if you don't feel your heart behind it. In prayer, God will bless this act of faith. And in time, you will begin to feel surrender. So spend time in worship. Worship is powerful. Whether you worship through music or in some other way that is in nature, spend time in the hour of the power of the Lord in which he works. Then scripture, the word of God is our weapon against the enemy. It has power to extinguish the attacks of Satan as we use it in faith. Find Bible verses about surrender and write them down. Find verses that encourage you in your current uh, current season and proclaim these, memorize them, saturate your life with them. So write a journal. You can write a journal. Your brain changes as you write. So as you're, as you're listening to teachings, keep writing. Your brain changes as you write. There's a power in journaling and writing down your thoughts, your fears, what is holding you back and writing down your commitment to surrender. It can help you to process the things that are holding you back and it can help you to more fully commit to surrender. So find accountability. Truly surrendering to God is a process and we are called to be in a community and fellowship as we grow in faith. Find someone who can encourage you and check in along the way. So we are in this group, this prayer group, the Holy Spirit prayer group. We are encouraging each other. We are praying for each other. So speak it over and over again. Our words have power, especially as we speak scripture. Proclaim your surrender out daily. This will retrain your heart from one holding too tight, uh, tightly to one to surrender, you know. So leave, let your, let, let's not hold on tightly to our things and surrender. So make a short prayer uh, as we end this session. I hope this session has blessed you all and you all have learned, you will learn how to surrender. So Lord, I commit my heart today and the hearts of all those present here today. I hope we open our hands before you and release the grip of our life, our things, our will and our actions. We proclaim that you are good and you are sovereign. We choose to trust your ways above our own today, Lord. We commit our day to you. May all that we do be done for you. We commit our families to you. We trust that you are at work in each one of them, all our families, you are at work in them. And I ask that you would have your hand of protection over them. Cover us with your precious blood, Lord, today. All those present here at this, at this meeting and all those who will be listening, Lord. Take control of our lives. Let your presence go with us. And we surrender fully to you right now in this moment. If there are any areas of our life or our heart that we are holding on too tightly to reveal those to us, Lord, and increase our faith as we learn to surrender. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word that you have shared with us today. And we thank you for the message that we you have calling us all to surrender to you. We make this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. sister. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for the beautiful message.